Good afternoon, everybody. How are you all? Thanks so much for coming out. Um, here we are here at the ULF Family Conference in Chicago. I know we've got a number of people here in the room, um, family members and some other researchers, as well as um, several families virtually. And um, we're really glad that you guys could join us today. Um, we've got a lot to talk about in a very short period of time. Um, I did have to shift the agenda around a little bit. Um, initially, I was going to start out with foundation updates um, and then move into um, the research status. But however, our friends here at UMass have to leave early. So we're going to start right into our um, AAV gene therapy um, that um, the foundation has um, entered into sponsored research agreement with UMass. And we are in our third year of the research. and. Um, so we're gonna start right there and then we can go into updates on the foundation and take it from there. All right, thank you. Um, Dominic uh, Gessler from UMass, thank you for joining us. Great, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Gessler, I'm a, I'm a, it's on now, yeah. I'm a um, clinician, clinician scientist in neurosurgery and gene therapy at UMass Chan Medical School. And I want to present on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Jun Shi, who's an associate professor at UMass, and his postdoc, um, Was Meng Bunying, who is doing all the work on HABC. And I'm talking a little bit about the different, you know, hurdles that come along when you try to develop therapy, trying to compare um, or highlight a little bit the differences between different strategies you can use if you use a virus versus not a virus. Um, so I hope, you know, and I'm happy, obviously, to answer any questions at the end. Okay. Um, obviously, you're, no one is in this room is a stranger to this disease. As you all know, it was described first by Dr. Uh, Mario van der Knab, and the disease-causing mutation actually was discovered by Dr. Van der Ver, who is sitting here in the audience um, in 2013. As you all know, it's a very rare disease, and it affects very distinctly certain regions in the brain. Um, one is what we call the basal ganglia in this area here, and then you can see the white matter, which is all the kind of bright signal you see here that changes over time. In addition, this is the area where you see the cerebellum, it's in the back of your head, and you can see how that kind of atrophies or becomes smaller and smaller. And you, you know, you're all familiar with the symptoms, um, unfortunately, they are progressive. What causes HAPC? Um, the way our cells basically work is similar. You can think about it, our, you know, we all have a skeleton. The skeleton helps us to you know, have a posture to move our legs in combined with the muscles. And what tube, uh, tube 4A does, it's part of the skeleton of a cell. So when there's a mutation, so the, enzyme, the protein doesn't function properly, the skeleton is basically not, you know, not able to form properly. And that affect, affects, um, in, in, in this condition, the oligodendrocytes and neurons. To come back to that skeleton again, we call it microfilaments or microtubules. And all these kind of greenish um, lines you see, this is basically the skeleton. It allows neurons to basically have out, outgrowth that go far away into distant parts of, of our body to control muscles and do other functions. In a similar way, oligodendrocytes form myelin around the neurons to, you know, for a lot of different reasons. But in order to make the myelin in like concentric, um, layers, you need also kind of a skeleton, like a scaffold, basically. And so, again, if you have a mutation, tube 4 a then that, those proteins cannot do their job. So, the, the, basically, the skeleton doesn't work the way it's supposed to. What is interesting about this, and I'm highlighting it here because it's a little different to what we can see in animal models, because animal models, as you know, are absolutely critical for research. Um, we typically, for most of our genes, we have two copies, one from the dad, one from the mom. And in tube 4 a or in HABC, only one copy has the mutation. The other one is actually healthy, but it leads to all those um, symptoms. And that's different because in the animal models, um, to see actually disease, we need to um, have the mutation in both copies. So that's a slight difference. So always keep in mind a mouse is not a human and a human is not a mouse. So sometimes that can make, you make things a little bit more challenging. The common mutation, the most common mutation so far that has been described is the D249N, and that's also what we try to simulate in the mouse model. Um, we're using a mouse model that was developed at Dr. Leem's lab at Yale University. As I said, it has that mutation. And 
when there's only one copy with the mutation, the mouse has no symptoms. But if you have two copies, it's a very severe symptom. You can see it around eight days of life. Those animals start having tremor. They're starting shaking. And that starts progressing. And when they walk around in the cage, they walk like this. So you can really see they don't look like a healthy mouse. And by, the, by about 38 days of life, they're already passing away. So it's a very, very severe presentation. It is more kind of exaggerated in comparison to humans. But sometimes that's very helpful when we make changes to our therapies because we see immediately if there's an effect. We don't have to wait for years to see for an effect. We can see within you know, 38 days if it does something to the mouse. Why do we think, so the strategy is um, to reduce TUB4A because we think that when there's a mutation in TUB4A, it's not what we call a loss of function mutation. So you can have a mutation where you lose the, the normal function of the, of the protein. In this case, we think that actually the mutation causes what we call a gain of function, meaning it acquires a new function that is, for, for many different reasons, unhealthy for the cell, and then the cells start dying, basically, and that causes the disease. With that in mind, when you have a gain of function, when you have a function that you don't want, one idea is, well, why don't we just get rid of the gene that is malfunctioning? And what you see here, this is an example um, in the mouse we cannot unfortunately do the same thing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a genetic strategy that we used here to demonstrate that removing the mutated gene is actually good. Okay, I try to walk you through here. So what you see here in black, those are untreated disease animals and you can see all of them die basically by 40 days of life. When you remove the TUB4A um, it, in mice that are 14 days old, 100% of all the mice survive. When you do this at a later time, at 21 days, the majority still survives, and that's also true for 28-day-old mice. But you can see that the later you try to treat, the effect is blunted, okay? So the idea that everyone is following is we are trying to basically reduce the tube for a that has a new function that you don't want. Um, and so how does, it, how does it work? So as you know, we all have our genes in the genome. Every cell in our body has genome. And the information in the gene is being transcribed into RNA. And that RNA has the information for the cells to make a protein. In this case, TUB4A. So what we have in HABC, we have a mutation in one of the genes in the TUB4A uh, gene. And then we get basically the same uh, mutated information in the RNA. And we get a protein that has a new function or a toxic function, you can actually call it. So one strategy is to reduce the toxic protein by attacking the RNA, okay? And that's the same principle, no matter if you use ASO or if you use microRNAs. MicroRNAs are existing in all of our bodies. Actually, Dr. Craig Mello got the Nobel Prize for this. He's at UMass and ASO uses the same principle. So for that reason, we have a lot of research in both areas going on at UMass because it's such a powerful system. When you, Combine this with AAV, what you can do is you can not only express the microRNA to knock it down, to reduce the amount of toxic protein. With AAV, we can also express at the same time the healthy gene. You can imagine there's a reason why we have a gene, why, why we have all those genes in our body, and just reducing one might not be the best thing. We don't know. But what we can do is we can at the same time express the healthy gene. So we're removing the toxic one and express the healthy ones to make sure there's no deficit in the cell. That's at least the idea behind it. Um, AAV, or adeno-associated virus, um, is a very powerful tool. It's being used in a lot of humans already. There are already gene therapies that have been approved by the FDA for the use in humans. And what's so neat about it is it has a protein capsule or an envelope, if you want. And the envelope is almost like the address you write on, a, on, an, on an envelope when you send a postcard. What it does is it allows you to go to different organs. So all these colors is basically A, B delivered some information to those. You can, can go to the brain, muscle, kidney, and so on and so on. And you can actually select the envelope. Basically, you're writing a different address and you will mail it to someone else. And so you can change the envelope, meaning the capsid, to have a preference, for example, for the brain to cross the blood-brain barrier. So in that case, we can give the AAV just inter as an intravenous infusion, as if you get like a continuous drip in the hospital. You don't have to inject it into the brain. You don't have to inject it into the spine. It just goes straight there. 
And just to highlight that once again. So this is basically the capsid. And then inside is the genome. So what it does, it has all the information you need. For example, the microRNA or the information of the healthy gene. And it has a regulatory element. And that regulatory element, I'll tell, uh, talk about it a little bit because it has provides something really neat about this platform. Um, you all have heard about ASOs. And as I said, microRNAs work in a similar way. ASOs are basically single-stranded uh, molecules that are complements to the RNA. In the situation of HABC, the RNA has the, the, the wrong information from the mutation. So what the ASO does, it binds to it, and then it has different, depending how you design your ASO, it can do different things. The goal in HABC is to reduce the protein. So it will basically either block the translation or it will destroy the RNA. MicroRNAs, and one thing about ASOs, ASO don't exist in our body. They require certain chemical modifications in order to make them function the way they are. Okay. Um, microRNAs are naturally occurring in our body. We basically just tell the body, hey, make this microRNA that we're giving you to reduce the protein. So it uses basically a machinery that's already present in your cell. And I don't want to make the point here, not one system is better than the other. They have both advantages and disadvantages, and both of them can be complementary at a certain point. Okay. But some of the highlights are for ASO, you, you, you have to give it repeatedly because after some time, they basically are being degraded. The idea for AAV is it's a one-time treatment and it stays in the cell and keeps expressing basically or, or producing those microRNAs that reduce the unhealthy protein. For that reason, for ASO, you need repeated injections. For AV, it's just a single infusion, preferentially just an IV, uh, intravenous infusion like a drip. Um, what you can do about with AAV is, um, I talked about that regulatory element. What it does is you can basically tell the AAV to express the microRNA only in a specific cell type. So in HABC, the mo main affected cells are oligodendrocytes and neurons. So we can make an AAV that only expresses the microRNA in those cell types. You might ask, well, why is that important? Because if you bring a drug or medication in a, in a place where it's not supposed to be, it can cause trouble. Um, so that's kind of the cell type specificity that I have listed here. The other neat aspect I showed you, we can also express the healthy gene at the same time. And in terms of delivery, they're working on the ASOs that, can you, that you can deliver IV to cross the blood-brain barrier to get to the brain, but you will expose the entire body to the ASO and you cannot regulate to say only go to a certain cell type. With the AV, we can give it intravenously and we can design it in a way that it only goes to a certain cell type or only expresses the microRNA in a certain cell type. So you can see each of them have like advantages and disadvantages. And depending, you know, where you are in the, in the whole process, it can be, you know, one, one might, might be available earlier than the other, but I wouldn't say one is better or the other. They have really, depending on the disease, have different advantages and disadvantages. So what June and his group um, at UMass, what they did is first is they designed different microRNAs to see which one works best. Because just because you can make 20 different microRNAs, it doesn't mean they work all the same. The same is true for ASOs. Not every ASO is the same. You have to design them and you have to test them to see which one works best. So what you can see here is on the top, this is the tube 4 a protein. And you can see number three and five work really well. You basically don't see any red or only a little bit, which means it's very effective in reducing the amount of the protein. And down here is just an quantification. So then the first step was, well, let's put in an AV and treat the animals and see what happens. Um, what we did here is the regulatory element here is um, basically expressing the microRNA in any cell type. It's not basically specific to a different cell type. So on the top, you see the healthy controls, and then we treated the animals with all kinds of different things, uh, variations of this, and in red is untreated, and you see all of them die, no benefit. We're like, well, that's that's strange. It work, looks like in, in cell culture, or it looks like the protein is really well reduced. But why do all the animals die? And as you can see here, we changed the capsid, which is the envelope. Different envelopes, as I said, have a different propensity to go to certain cell types. We changed the dose. We changed the way of delivery. In some cases, we injected it straight into the brain. In some situations, we gave, gave it IV, and we even changed the day, the age of treatment. And you see, nothing worked. 
So then we went back to the different components of a gene therapy. And as I earlier said, you have the capsid or the AV. Obviously, your target cell is very important. What route of administration you choose and so on. And one thing we looked at, we said, well, why don't we use a promoter that's only active in oligodendrocytes? Maybe that makes a difference because oligodendrocytes are the main cell expressing tube 4 a So June and his team in B designed a second generation vector where they used a, a regulatory element, we call it a promoter, that only works in oligodendrocytes. And just to show you what that, how, how that looks. So this here is a mouse brain when you cut it like this and you look from the side, okay? Here's the cerebellum, here's the brainstem, here's the corpus callosum, callosum. And then when we looked at the green signal that came from the AAV and we look at oligodendrocyte marker, we see no overlap. So we expressed a lot of microRNA, but it wasn't in the right cell. Then we switched to the regulatory element that's being, that allows it to express it only in oligodendrocytes. And you can see here the corpus callosum, it has a lot of white matter, a lot of oligodendrocytes. You see the, you see the cerebellum, all this like, tree-like pattern, this is all white matter. There's a lot of oligodendrocytes. And all this area here is that it shows up in green, same, same thing in the uh, brainstem. And you can see all these green dots are all cells that got the green color basically delivered by the virus. When you look for, when you uh, stain for oligodendrocyte marker, you can see there a lot of overlap, which means in this scenario, we delivered um, the the green color successfully to oligodendrocytes. So then we switched out the green color for the microRNA. And what you can see, so this, what it shows you here is body weight. Body weight in animals is basically a marker of general health. When animals are sick, the, the health, and their health goes down, their body weight is dropping. So you can see here again in, in black, this is the healthy control. In red is the untreated mouse. Again, this mouse has two genes with a mutation, not just one like in humans. So you have double the amount of toxic protein. So it's a little bit more extreme than what we have in humans. And you can see these mice start not stop gaining weight. And then around here, there are not many more mice left because they all pass away. Then when we treated them with the AAV gene therapy, you can see their pattern follows much more the wild type. And then they kind of plateau. And then at the end, they start coming down a little bit. And we are trying to find, understand why they're coming down and what we can do about it. When you look at the survival of those animals, on the top unhealth, as are the healthy controls, in red again are the untreated animals, and then in green and in blue, those are basically, those are the same microRNAs, but they have two different capsids, so the envelope with the address is different. And you can, but you can see that the green one is able to extend the survival quite a bit, and the, even the blue one, especially down here, is able to extend survival. So the encouraging thing is, you know, things are working. We see some therapeutic response. It's not as perfect as we like to have it, but as you saw in an AAV-based gene therapy, there are a lot of components that we can kind of fine tune. So the hope obviously is, and what we're working on is to fine tune and fine tune to get better and better results. With the promise of that we one day need only a single, single infusion uh, for treatment. And then lastly, I'm sure you have all seen MRIs of the brain more than you probably want. Um, you can do the same in mice. Here you see a wild type, like a healthy uh, mouse. This is the brainstem, this is the cerebellum. Down here you have some of the basal ganglia. You have, this is the corpus callosum. What you can see in this mouse, it's 33 days old. So it's not very old for a mouse. Mouse can become up to two years and even longer. You see all this kind of bright signal in these areas. This is all not supposed to be there. This is all part of the disease. In this mouse here, we treated with a, a single in, uh, injection. You can see there's still, you know, it's not perfect. There's still some um, white signal, but it's overall improved in comparison to this mouse. In addition, this mouse is 33 days, days old. This mouse is two weeks older. At that time, the untreated animal should be already dead. So there's clearly something happening that's good and it kind of extends the life. But as I said, it's not perfect yet. So to kind of summarize this briefly, I hope you could follow that the idea of delivering the microRNA to a specific cell type made a big difference. You know, when we use the promoter, the regulatory element to get it in, into every cell, all the, mice, all the mice died. When we focused on the oligodendrocytes, the mice, mice started surviving. So it seems like, 
trying to make it more specific might be uh, helpful. Otherwise, uh, other things I showed you, the weight curve was improved. Um, overall survival was improved. What I did I didn't show you is these animals develop very, very se severe seizures. And often we see those seizures in the mice and never wake up from the seizure. So it's a very severe um, disease progression, um, but it's reduced after the therapy as well. And then some of the brain signal was also improved. So what's next? The microRNA that is binding to the RNA to reduce your protein is only being made to a certain, certain amount, right? And then it's plateaus. So what you can do is an AAV, we're just gonna put in two of them. So we produce twice as much, hoping that this is even more effective. So this is a version of a, of a AAV that we're testing right now. And then I mentioned briefly, we can also express the healthy gene at the same time. So these two basically are the same as this, but we are expressing the healthy gene to see if this actually is also important or is actually needed. As I said, nature typically just doesn't give you a gene that you don't need. There's typically a reason for it. So just getting rid of it might be challenging sometimes. So we are evaluating, you know, if there's any benefit to this. Um, and then with that, I just wanna acknowledge, so Dr. Jun Shi, who is the leader of this project and his, um, postdoc, and then obviously Dr. Gao um, sitting here in the audience. Um, everyone probably knows him as a, uh, as a leader in the gene therapy field in terms of, um, he discovered most of the AAVs that everyone is using nowadays, even the one in SM8 that's being already market approved. This is all his work. I mean, the AAVs are his work. Um, Canavan is one of the big things that he has been working on his entire life. So he's kind of the director of the gene therapy center. And yeah, with that, um, thank you for your uh, uh, attention. I'm, take, I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so my brain goes to age, okay? Because I see all these little kiddos. When you test the mice, were they different ages? To see like, okay, my daughter's going to be 19. Is it... I hate to say this, and I don't mean it in a bad way, but should we have, I mean, wish we'd have known this 20, you know, 20 years ago, right? Is there a chance that no matter what the age, we can still see a benefit? Um, and a, you can be, I mean, it, yeah, it, it, if you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. I totally understand. Well, that's that. a very good question. So let me answer it. Let me paraphrase it a little bit. Okay. Our brain has an incredible capacity to recover, right? You see someone in, in their 60s, 70s having a stroke, and they can regain some of the function. But we don't know how much, depending on the disease progression, the brain can recover. So that's a, it's an open question. Um, overall, when you look at all the gene therapy trials, no matter if it's ACE or if it's AV gene therapy, if you look at, at all these trials, it seems like everyone agrees the sooner the better. But that is also not a definitive answer. We just haven't had the situation where too soon was also a problem, right? So there's probably a sweet spot, but in many situations, we unfortunately don't know yet. So just to pair it maybe with you, and I mean, because I, I don't know where this is all at and like what level and when can we try it? Yeah, I know. You know, I mean, I just am like, okay, can I just take some home? <laughs> you know what you know what I mean? Yeah. I just am so excited. This has just been like we went from like in my own head, like way back, you know, from nothing to wow. Yeah. You guys have you've done great things here. And I just I just like there's hope. Right. You know. The, I think a key aspect is we don't certainly want to harm anyone. So understanding the therapy as much as we can is critical to minimize the risk because it, this is all experimental, right? ASOs are experimental, AV is experimental. We don't know what, you know, it necess necessarily happens. Um, we, you know, we can only think, okay, in the animal it works well, but is that the same happening in a human being? We don't know. And you can see that across the country and worldwide in the gene therapy trials, sometimes we have learned a lot in the last 10 years in the gene therapy trials, things happen that we never anticipated. And so every disease is different too. You never know, maybe HABC is different or people with HABC respond different to any sort of therapy than in another disease. So there are all these little nuances and that's why it's so important to, to have a trial to answer those questions. So when, and maybe you don't know this either, like any projected trial? time frame 
Are we there I, yet? I, or I, we can't not? I can't. Can, I can't tell you so I'm much. Sorry, I just. No, no, no. I totally understand. I totally, like, you know, great. we we have been. I I've been working for more than ten years on Kahneman's disease, and I remember particularly. Actually, I, I told me I told Michelle yesterday. I remember particularly a family. Every time I saw them, they like. Do you have a little bit of virus for my daughter? <laughs> it, you know, unfortunately, that's that's not you know, unfortunately, not that easy. Yeah. Um, I can tell you, people in the lab get up every morning to you know have the patients in mind and try to, to do their best and work hard. Um, we can unfortunately not trick biology as much as we like. Oh, true. So there is a limitation in how fast you can go, and so for that reason, it's really tough to to make a prediction. Um, sorry, I wish I had better answers. Do you think you have any off-target effects to other tubulins? That's a that's a, a very good question. Do you want me to explain why I'm asking the question? Just sure. Just because I think so. The one of the concerns is that a lot of the tubulins, which there are lots of different tubulins in the cell, are very similar, and so any techniques that we are going to use or you're going to use might affect other tubulins that we don't mean to affect. So I'm just asking, like, right, right. like because that's yeah. a problem we face. So I'm just asking yeah, you, yeah. like, how are you handling that? Right, right. So the off-target effect is basically, it's a similar to, you take an aspirin for your headache. If you take too much aspirin, you get issues somewhere else, right? You maybe get liver issues or your blood gets too thin and you start bleeding easily. Same is true for this kind of therapy. Even though we designed it perfectly fitting that gene, there might be, it doesn't, might, might not have to bind perfectly to a different gene and can cause an effect on a different gene. If that makes sense. Um, the, the way, the way we, we, I mean, the same, for, so for ASOs, for microRNAs, the design is basically you use a computer, computer-based model that predicts the chance of basically off-target effect. And you're obviously picking the ones that have predicted to be zero, but nevertheless, um, that is always a concern. Um, so we haven't done any RNA transcriptomics yet. So one, one thing you can do is you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. so we haven't done any transcriptomic yet to see if there's a variation or if, yeah. So we've designed a nanostring um, mm -hmm. uh, that we'd be happy to share because then it's pretty easy because then you don't have to do, you know, RNA-seq. Oh, yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? And so we have one with all the other sort oh, of similar tubulins yeah. um, that we are using, which is part of why I was asking because yeah. we'd be happy to share um, yeah, the code that, set. That's great, especially nanostring because nanostring goes it's on quick. a molecular basis yeah. and it's not, uh, yeah, you have, don't have the amplifying effects you need for yeah. it. Exactly. Library building. And it's semi-quantitative and yeah, you can do yeah, it. So anyways, just, yeah. just a toolkit that we've yeah. used. So. Yeah. So basically what we were just talking about. So every gene, all the thousands of genes we have, all of those typically make the RNA and then make the protein. So when you target one RNA to reduce the protein, the risk is that you can accidentally target another RNA from, from a different gene. So what you can do is you can look at the RNAs of those different genes if they change when you treat, kind of saying, well, if it changes, maybe you have an off-target target effect. That makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, I'm just, I come from a world of acronyms too in, in, yeah. in finance and yeah. I don't know what RNA so is. You, I mean, is there DNA and RNA? Are they like that kind of RNA? They're similar. Yeah, yeah. RNA, yeah, that kind, kind of RNA. So you have all of, all of our genes are in DNA, the uh, deoxynucleotides, nucleoreboxyates, acid. We use it so many times that I don't even know it anymore. And then RNA is very similar to DNA, but it is, I guess, it, it, the function is a little different and the biology is a little different. And there's one nucleotide that's a little bit different. Nucleotides, we have four nucleotides and all those four nucleotides make our entire genetic code. So the order of those nucleotides determines the information that's inside a gene. So you can basically think about four, four different uh, nucleotides and they can have all kinds of different orders. And all that is the information. Spec basically, Why our do you guys not lose your mind? Why do you not lose your mind doing this every day? It's I can't like, even it's like our alpha. Right? Bit, I mean, you know? am I am I alone? Or I mean, I just go like, whoa! I'm so glad there's so many more smart people than me out there. I don't know. We just try to do something. You know? Yeah, exactly. Okay, I'll trade. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll I'll yeah. do your, I'll do that part. You take. Okay, that's a good trade. We can tell sign that later. Yeah. So uh, first of all, I'm I'm very happy to uh, be able to present something, some progress to you guys this time. I think our collaboration with uh, uh, by the HABC Foundation started about three years ago, almost. 
and just around the corner of a COVID or beginning of the COVID. And like anything else, we had a wall all the time uh, in the beginning. And particularly this animal model itself, it's much more severe than human disease, human pheno disease phenotypes. The animals just die fast, very fast. Uh, within a little over a month, they all die. They all, since born, start early days, start having those tremors and cannot walk and all those symptoms. And uh, we spent uh, effort to figure out from delivery, which is the AV capsid. Unfortunately, I started working on those AV capsids uh, about 29 years ago when I was at Penn and at UPenn. And also we started working the, the uh, gene uh, drug payload and uh, on different things. Eventually, just about, uh, I believe about three months ago <laughs> or four months ago, we emailed Michelle and said, Hey, Michelle, finally, we saw a, a light through tunnel and we just have been lost for a long time. And we start seeing the train that may be hopeful. Um, so at this point, uh, we really appreciate the community and the foundation and part particularly Michelle's uh, leadership and uh, family's patience. And we're going to move as fast as we can. And I think you can see we're not perfect, but we show this is hopeful. And so we're trying to optimize all the conditions you can think of and, and trying to uh, come out the therapy. At least we hope we can improve the health of mouse. But how to translate that improvement into our human patient, like patients sit here and the family and benefit the family and patients. I think we have a long way to go as, as Dominic just said, but I think we're determined. We all work for the patients and the families. So yeah, we will do our best. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to uh, speak. I think there's a little bit of overlap in the explanations of uh, sort of what HABC is. Um, I think it's, if, unless everybody tells me that they're fully familiar with HABC and they don't need any other explanation of what it is, I think I'll still go through it because I think each one of us explains it a little bit differently and it bears repeating because it's not, these are not uh, intuitive um, concepts, right? Before I, I get started, I just want to um, acknowledge and honor um, the many people who work with us. We do a, spend a lot of time working on natural history study because we're trying to prepare for clinical trials and that um, involves a clinical advisory board. And I, I want to be grateful to all the people who volunteer their time on our clinical advisory board. Um, so Mario Van Aknap, uh, Jeanette Bernard, David Tonduti, um, uh, Evelyn Wasmer, um, Nicole Wolf, um, Dr. Garcia, and uh, Dr. Henry Holden are all sort of helping us pr prepare and think for um, what we need to do for clinical trials. And then I also have a large team um, at CHOP, uh, uh, as well as many people who supported our, our work over the past years. And I'm grateful to everybody and speaking on their behalf. So I think it also, you know, as we think about like how urgent we all feel it is to have a therapy and recognizing it, I think it bears remembering that this is a fairly new disease, right? So Maria Van Knapp identified it only in 2002. She's a, a magician about reading MRI. So she picked out um, the fact that uh, there was a certain group of children who were sort of missing certain parts in their eyes around the basal ganglia, which was something nobody had seen before. Um, and then, you know, largely thanks to advances in, in genetic testing techniques, which I'll explain in a minute why we were able to help identify uh, the gene, but that's only been about 10 years ago, right? So this is this is a new disease. We're still learning a lot and, um, and we still have a lot to learn before we'll be perfectly ready for clinical trials, unfortunately. Um, but we all want uh, a therapy to be developed and we all think a therapy is feasible and conceivable, which is, I think is an important um, step. So just um, thinking about, because this is a question I get a lot when I see patients, sort of what is HABC? What is top rate associated leukodystrophy? What do all these terms mean? Um, I think it's helpful to talk a little bit about the history of how the disease um, was first identified. So the very first patients that Mario Van Achnap, uh, found were, and this is, uh, you, this is a wonderful uh, uh, prompt. Thank you very much. So the very first thing is Mario Van Achnap noticed, right, that this particular part in addition to having low myelin of the brain called the putamen was missing. 
in certain children who had low amounts of myelin, also called hypomyelination, right? And she also noticed that those children had smaller cerebellums, right? The medical word for smaller um, is atrophy, right? And so really it was hypomyelination because the myelination is low with atrophy of the basal ganglia because that's the group name for this part of the brain and cerebellum. And that's where that name came from. But for a long time, we didn't know, right? Although we recognized that these kids were, um, you know, were co had common symptoms with problems with their motor function, with problems with um, um, losing the ability to speak and losing a lot of their um, earlier acquired milestones and motor skills and hand use. We we didn't know what was causing it, right? And that's because um, there was only one typically child affected in a family, right? So that makes it very hard to identify genetic causes if there's only one, one person affected in a family because you can't look at the parents, look at the siblings and try to understand what's um, common and not common. And at least by old fashioned genetic testing techniques, which were called things like linkage and sequencing and things like that, it was very difficult to try to identify these what's called sporadic or de novo mutations. And and as was already explained, you know, compared to something hereditary where you have a number of people in a family, sometimes it's inherited in a dominant fashion, sometimes it's inherited in a um, in a recessive fashion where both parents are carriers but don't have disease, you can do all kinds of genetic tests to sort of figure out what how things run through families when it's sporadic and there's only one person, you're much more limited. But so when things like whole exome sequencing, which some of you may have been diagnosed by, became more available, it became... I'm not going to say child's play, but a lot easier to find things. And so the the first thing that happened is, you know, we collaborated with a bunch of people to to take DNA from patients that had been um, identified over the years and just match them together um, and found the the variant. And at, at almost exactly the same time, right? Other groups found other patients that were affected in different ways. So the patients that we identified had classic HABC with those MRI findings that I described and with sort of um, very early onset presentations. But there are other groups that identified grownups who didn't have any MRI abnormalities at all and who had something called dystonia. So they've been perfectly normal their whole lives. But, you know, when they were in 30 or 40s or even a little bit older, they developed motor problems and they developed speech problems. Um, that in a way might be very familiar to those of you who have children who've been affected their whole lives, but that just appeared much later, right? And that's called um, uh, um, DYT4 for type four dystonia, right? And then shortly after that, we found other children who didn't have sort of all the features of the disease. They might have presented a little bit earlier. They might have presented a little bit later. There was this whole period of time where people were writing letters to the editor because some people were saying, well, if you don't have the common mutation, then you're going to be more sick. And other people are saying, no, 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 that's not true. If you don't have the common mutation, you're going to be less sick. And it's just because there were multiple groups in there and a lot of diversity. Um, and, you know, as we now sequence a lot more more and more people with these very broad genetic techniques, we're able to sort of look at, at not people presenting a certain way and therefore getting genetic testing, but just people getting genetic testing and then figuring out what that means. So, so now that we can look at a lot of genetic testing in, in this day and age, we realize that actually tub 4 a mutations are the most common cause of hypomyelinating leukodystrophy. So what we thought was ultra rare, when we put sort of all those little pieces and types of different presentations together, is a not really truly uncommon leukodystrophy. It's still a rare disease, right? But in, in my space, um, it's not an uncommon thing. And we, we see lots of kids affected by um, this disorder. Um, and um, just again, to regroup, right, there are lots of tubulins in, that your cell makes. Each cell in the body makes different tubulins and sometimes multiple different tubulins. But tub four, right, is, is one of, of many tubulins that are made. There's always an A and a B, right? The, they form these little groups together. Those two groups together form a ladder called microtubules that are like the, the some, some highways within the cell, right? Um, and there's this beautiful movie, right, called Inner Life of the Cell that, um, that if you want to sort of show your family, you know, what um, tubulin does in the cell is very helpful to look at. Um, I decided not to put an active video because videos always mess up in talks like this, so I'm not showing it. But but it's it's wonderful to look at, and what it shows in this in this video is that these little pieces, right? These are the, you see these little top, the the A and the B that form these little best friends that then form these highways, right? 
um, is that they get made and unmade all the time. So it's kind of as if you, it's a road for the cell. It's kind of like you get to the, you want to go to the grocery store. You go with your best friend to the grocery store because you like to go shopping with your best friend. You get in the car and instead of there just being a road there, the road is made as you go and gets pulled back up behind you, right? And then you decide to go to the mall afterwards Well, they make a new road, right? So it's a little, it's a very, the cell functions in a really different way. And, um, and importantly, we think, that some of these mutations, you know, affect how these little pieces, how these best friends tie together and how they tie together into these big, bigger tubes called microtubules so that you, um, so, so that they don't, they either are too sticky or not sticky enough and they don't, they don't assemble and disassemble in um, the right way, right? And these, these, um, and my kids always think it's creepy when I show them this video because it's this big blob getting pulled along by this little motor. There are these, these proteins in the cell called molecular motors that literally attach to that microtubule and sort of like an inchworm pull along proteins. And so this is largely thought to be a problem of trafficking within the, within the cell. And again, where the mutations are might affect how these little motors affect and how efficient they are being able to pull things through the cell. And it's likely that different mutations affect this function in different ways. And there's um, new studies that have shown that that's probably the case. Um, and, and what that looks like for a, for a human being, you know, going on a macroscopic level, is that the cells in the brain, and there are a number of different cells, get sick, right? And so we know that, that some of the structures get smaller, right? We know that some of the cells um, are accumulate these sort of um, spheroids, right? And we know that, that overall there's something called gliosis and that there's decrease in myelin. Um, so if you... Um, if you think about right this this group, and when families ask me, well, do we have HABC or do we have top four associated leukodystrophy? What I say really is that um, these are all parts of a whole, right? So the whole um, the whole group is considered top four A disorders, right? There are some people who have white matter abnormalities on MRI, right? So most children have white matter abnormalities. But again, like I discussed, the adults don't, and they also don't have visible basal ganglia atrophy, and they typically don't have D249 mutations. And so we talk about tuff ray disorder or tuff ray encephalopathy or DYT4. But then most children do, right? And some of them have basal ganglia atrophy, yes. And especially if they have a D249 mutation, we often talk about them as having classic HABC or atypical HABC if they don't have the common mutation. Versus if patients have white matter abnormalities but don't have um, basal ganglia atrophy, then we talk about tuff ray leukodystrophy. Does that, does that sort of make sense and explain that? Um, and I wouldn't, you know, I don't think the name matters so much because in all honesty, the treatments are going to be the same. In all cases, we need to, to um, remove that, that those um, tough arrays that don't do a good job assembling and disassembling into microtubules. So I think we spend a lot of time worrying in, in my neck of the woods about about us not being ready for clinical trials that are ready in mice. You know, we there's an enormous amount of progress being made across all the leukodystrophies in getting new ideas on what's called preclinical, which means before you put it in people, and which typically means in cells and in mice, um, a lot of data about how to, to sort of treat diseases. But if you don't know how you're going to test them in patients, you might it might take a long time. And so we're advocating very much for treatments and clinical development plans, which is how you test the, the, the treatments to be developed at the same time. So one's not behind the other. So we're spending a lot of time right now with the generous help of a lot of the families who are contributing information about their children and participating in outcomes to understand what happens in the disease, right? Um, and we, we've learned a couple of things and I wanna share those things with you um, for, for in so much as it's helpful. The first thing is that it does seem that the specific mutation you have matters, right? So the largest group is the D249N, right? And those patients tend to look very similar one to another, right? And um, the other thing that matters is how early you get sick, right? So this is, this is something where we see people who present before they get sick, and this is something where we see people who present after, um, sorry, before 12 months and after 12 months. So children who start having a lot of symptoms, right, before they're, they're a year of age are going to have a harder time um, reaching certain milestones. And I mean, and that's kind of, it's kind of intuitive, right? It makes sense. It's not a big surprise, but it's important to start thinking about what thresholds so that when we think about when we're designing clinical trials, we're comparing patients who are the same within a clinical trial so that we can judge adequately if, if a treatment works. 
Um, and, and the thing is that we also know is that depending on your mutation, even if you present at the same age, right, you and look the same early on, you might progress differently. So one thing that we've learned, um, for example, is that patients with the classic HABC, they, um, you know, they are going to uh, look milder in the beginning, but over time, they're also going to lose skills more quickly than some other children. Um, and it's also important to know that while top D249N is the most common mutation, there are a bunch of other mutations that we see again and again. And when we look at children who have the exact same mutation, they tend to look the same as other children who have the exact same mutation. And I'm seeing smiles in the room and that's because some of you know this already because you've met children with the exact same mutation as your child. And then you're like, you know, these children are the same. They, 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 they've achieved the same kind of milestones and they've had the same kind of problems. Um, and so uh, we, we have um, spent a lot of time sort of trying to understand what we can predict about milestones, right? Who learns to walk when children lose the ability to learn to walk? Who learns to sit when children lose the ability to learn to sit? And the hope is that by doing that, we'll be able to say uh, to, you know, the FDA or the EMA, you know, when we do do a treatment, if children learn or maintain skills in a way that is not expected, we'll be able to point out to the EMA or the FDA that that really is different that would be expected for the disease. And that's called understanding the natural history of the disease. Um, and the hope is that some of these therapies are complicated to have controls for because, you know, you can imagine um, you're not going to want to do what's called sham um, necessarily sh uh, a sham treatment if you have to do a brain applied treatment, be it either for gene therapy or for ASOs. And so you want to not necessarily have to have a group that's not getting the treatment or that's getting something that looks like the treatment, but is not. And so in increasingly the FDA is receptive to ideas of so having something called non-concurrent controls, which is if there's enough understanding of what the disease should like without treatment, they allow you to have everybody in a treatment group instead. Um, and so when we think about um, different groups, we, we're sort of starting to understand that there's probably three main groups of um, ch children. And this is separate from, from sort of the adult presentations and the juvenile presentations. But when we're talking about children, there are probably three main groups. The first group is something called early infantile. It's somebody who presents very early, often is very low tone, right? Has a really hard time gaining even early developmental milestones, typically does not learn to sit um, in the first uh, year or so of life, right? And then, um, and then has a very hard time gaining other motor milestones. I think the important thing is that a lot of those children actually have very preserved cognition, right? And I'm not going to show the cognitive data, um, but we see surprising data about children with nonverbal IQ measurements that that actually they're very, um, uh, they're they're um, much more intact than you would assume based on their motor skills, right? So keep in mind when I'm showing things that this is about the motor skills, and that's partially because it's an easy readout to show the FDA. Right. Um, then the second group is what we call the late infantile. And in the late infantile, there's sort of two big groups. One is the d 4 nn mutations and one is all the other people. Right. And, um, and we know that the children who have um, the d 2 n mutations, they, they probably learn to walk at a higher frequency than other children, but they also unfortunately lose it and they might lose it earlier than people who are late infantile and other types of mutations. And so this may seem you know, things that, well, you know, you know already if your child has learned or lost the ability to walk, for example, or learned or lost the ability to sit. But when we're trying to put people in clinical trials, especially if we're not going to put people, we're going to put most people in a treatment trial and not have a lot of people getting a placebo, it's going to be really important to be able to predict um, how children should behave um, without the medication to be able to test how the medication is working. Right. And so this is, these are our patients. It's, it's too small, but they're actually different um, mutations in here. We also know that people with the same kind of mutation actually, um, you know, advance in the same kind of way, right? So apart from D249N, it's just easy to pick on that one because there are a lot of them, but other people who have the same mutation also look uh, very similar. And we can do the same kind of um, uh, assessments uh, with motor skills, but we can also do it with things like speech, right? So, um, uh, this is the communication um, uh, function. Um, and so there are a lot of scores and things that we are working on to show and be, be able to predict, therefore, within these groups, how children do over time. Um, 
And then the other thing that can be useful sometimes both in clinical trials and also in understanding just for, for doctors taking care of people and for pa parents who, who are caring for children is what to expect from an overall health perspective. And within these groups, we also have differences. And I'm sorry, this is like actually way too small uh, to read, but we can show differences in how often and how early uh, people might uh, develop the need for a G-tube or have scoliosis or have need hip surgery for for um, hip um, dislocation. And that becomes important because then I, as a doctor who cares for children, know when I have to start involving my friends, the orthopedic surgeon, or know when I have to start getting x-rays, or know when I have to really start watching somebody's weight to make sure we don't let people become malnourished. Because all these things right now, you know, we're focused on maintaining people to be as healthy as they can, hoping that treatments are going to come. But, but in later years, you also want to make sure that people are maintained uh, well enough to participate in those clinical trials. So this is just sort of a, a summary slide showing this early infantile onset, right? This late infantile onset with a large number of patients who have this common need for an mutation, and then this outlier group with sort of juvenile and adult onset that are much milder and much harder to predict. Um, the other thing that is important to the FDA and to um, and, and groups like the EMA and also obviously to, to people in, uh, for caring for these children are what the impact of the disease is. And what, what this does is preparing for clinical trials is making sure that the things that are being measured in a clinical trial are what actually matters to the patients and their families, right? Because the FDA really says that, that we need to make sure the children feel and function better. Well, if, if we're fixing something that doesn't matter to families and doesn't make people feel better, right, that, that's not the point, right? So the, we're working on what's called um, impact of disease, right? And so our group and some of you in this room have probably been sent surveys and I just want to thank you for participating in those surveys because we know they're painful, but this is just the only way for us to do these things um, is to really look at what, what uh, the, how this affects quality of life, right? And I think that, um, you know, there's, a, there's um, a really big impact on physical function, right? With a less big impact, people report to us on emotional, social function, right? And when we look at... Um, things that matter to people, we also see that people, you know, really prioritize comfort, right? And um, really prioritize also um, uh, sort of overall, overall quality of life, right? And when, and another important thing is that these tests can actually score, like what's most important and what's least important to families, and also allow us to say, and the colors don't come through here, so I apologize, but the, 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 there's a difference you can just see between people who have um, younger children and people who have older children, just because you're at a different phase in the disease. So understanding that that might, that, that what matters and, you know, to back to the question you asked, right, you know, about when the, the therapy is administered, well, the outcome might be different, but if what matters to you is also different, that might be still acceptable to the FDA, right? Um, and then, you know, also acknowledging, and this becomes important also when you're talking about having insurance company pay, insurance companies pay, you know, for very potentially expensive therapies, you know, we also look at, at what happens to caregivers, right? And, and there are ways to measure both financial well-being and emotional well-being of families so that we can factor that in um, when we're talking about reimbursement of potentially really expensive therapies that how much this disease impacts an entire family. Um, and then uh, I'm going to talk briefly, you already heard about gene therapy, I'm going to talk briefly about another um, therapeutic type, right? Um, and I think that that one of the things that I wanted to do is sort of take a step back and do a 10,000 foot view, because I think because there's so many therapies available in the Luke Dushvi space now or ideas for therapies, a lot of times families come to me and say, well, why aren't we doing a bone marrow transplant? Or why aren't we doing CRISPR, right? And so I think it's a good idea to sort of take a step back and also talk about why you know, we're here talking about antisense and, and gene therapy today and not bone marrow transplants. So there are um, disorders in the Lugdish free space that you might have met families, right, that are um, missing enzymes, right? Well, if you have a missing enzyme, you can give that enzyme. And people choose to give that enzyme actually administering the enzyme itself. So there are um, clinical trials right now in the Lugdish free space, and they're ones that they're more common in non Lugdish free genetic disorders where people are just literally returning the enzyme to the body in its full form as if you were taking a medicine. But that's not going to work for HABC because it's not a missing enzyme. So we can't do that. And there'd be no way, if you ate a little pill with tons of Tupperware in it, there'd be no way to get it into the right cells. They would just get eaten up by your body and, and not go anywhere useful, right? 
So um, the other thing that people do sometimes is they replace the missing gene, right? And so that's something, for example, that Dr. Gao is doing for for um, uh, for, for Canavan's disease, and uh, and that is done for other leukodystrophies. Um, but but and that might. Um, that might help in partially for TUP4A, but TUP4A is something called gain of function, not loss of function. We think that just the presence of the mutated, um, uh, the presence of the mutated gene is problematic in itself because it sort of gums up the works. So it's not like you're just missing something and there's an absence of something. You actually something that's toxic. The, the body's effectively making a toxic version of the protein. So that's what the, the word gain of function means, if you've ever heard that, um, as people talk about it. Um, and then there's the antisense approach I'm going to talk about. Um, and then there's other there's other approaches that are more sort of getting rid of byproducts, right? So, and then finally, there's gene editing, which might be beneficial at some point, but is still very early stage and is really only being tried in certain types of, of disorders because it's still hard to get some of those gene editing things into the right cells. So it's a very broad landscape of therapies, some of which are applicable to, um, to uh, TUP4A and some of which are not. So here, back to the RNA DNA question, um, and, and I know this was covered already a fair bit, but I'm just going to go over it one more time. So you have DNA, and when your DNA is making proteins, it, it's opened up, right, by something called an RNA polymerase, and makes something called RNA, right? Um, and then that RNA gets transcribed, and some of you might be remembering vaguely your high school biology classes, so if this looks painful and you remember Mrs. So-and-so, I apologize, but... Um, but you have a ribosome and then that ribosome makes proteins, right? So um, the approaches, both of the approaches that are being described today basically interfere with that process, right? And basically you have an antisense, right? That comes in and blocks it. And then the ribosome can no longer attach and can no longer make the, the protein that as we've discussed is toxic and sort of gums up the works and creates problems. All right. And uh, importantly for antisense, uh, and, but also importantly for microRNA, as at least uh, conceptually, these therapies already exist and already approved. So the SMA therapy that made so much news a couple of years ago is actually an antisense approach. Um, so we've been working for a couple of years. Oh, and the video is working. I didn't know it was going to work. Okay. I don't know why the other one's not working. Um, we a couple of years ago made, and we use a very similar mouse. It's not the exact same mouse, but it's a very similar mouse that we developed in our in our lab. And this is uh, older data. Some of you might have seen the poster um, with with a slightly modified mouse model downstairs. Um, but with an antisense approach, for example, in that in that newer, milder mouse that we described downstairs, we've been able to extend the lifespan of the mouse at least three times. They're still alive, right? At least three times what they were um, before and allow the mice to recuperate some uh, degree of mileage. Oh, there it is. So the mouse that, that has a little red tag is treated, right? Versus the other one is not. Right? And mice are supposed to do a lot of um, exploring. So a very active mouse is a healthier mouse. It's not the mouse you want in your kitchen, but a very active mouse is a healthier mouse. And so um, the mice, when they're treated, are, are much more um, active and well uh, appearing. And they um, also have fewer seizures. And they, they, when we look at their brains under a microscope, they have preserved um, myelination and overall brain structure. So um, there's a company that's um, founded by a a parent with um, HABC um, that has raised money and is working to develop um, a therapy. This is the slide I'm allowed to, to share about it. Um, and they um, are working with us so that we can share some of what the lessons we've learned um, and hopefully make it available more uh, quickly. Drug companies um, are more flexible for actually doing some of the work needed to develop uh, drugs into um, things that can be put in clinical trials. And so we're working closely uh, with them. Um, and they're currently doing um, things to prepare for submission to the FDA, which is called safety and toxicology. There's no time frame for it yet because I know somebody's going to ask, um, but people are working hard. And I think the encouraging thing is that you, you, know, you have more than one egg in your basket, right, which I think is a really good thing. Um, because it's likely that at different disease phases, even if the best case scenario and both things work really well, you know, it's likely that at different disease phases and in different ways, different therapies might be appropriate for different people. We don't treat cancer with one chemotherapeutic agent, and it may be that we don't treat um, these rare diseases with one, with one medication either. Um, 
And so again, no specific time frame available, but there's very active work going on um, and we hope to, to have meaningful progress soon. Um, I think I just wanna remind everybody as we're talking about these exciting therapies about what it will take to actually get something that's a concept and being given to mice into people, right? So the first thing is sort of a robust treatment modality, a good idea, right? And that checkbox you already have, right? Um, and, and with more than one. And then a clear ability of the treatment to modify to for a function or amount, right? Again, to some degree checkbox you have that in mice, but that's still gonna need to be shown in probably other models. Most treatments in the FDA require several types of models to be treated. And, um, and then um, and then you also need, like I discussed before, good ways of understanding the ways tough for a disease presents and evolves in people um, so that you can know what your treatment might mean for people. And then measures of function in people that change with treatment. So that's why the natural histories are important. And then biomarkers that change with treatment. And all those, some of those things really still need to be worked out before we're ready to put something in human beings. Because even if we were to put it and it would work, if we can't measure how it's working, we won't get it approved by the FDA. We won't get it reimbursed by insurance. And then that means we won't get it to people. Um, and so this is where our team is spending a lot of effort right now. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, everybody can help by participating in natural history studies. And uh, we're lucky, a chap that we're funded by the NIH for a lot of natural history studies, that also comes with a lot of responsibility for public sharing. Um, so we've made a commitment that we share um, uh, our natural history data to um, all treatment advances. And then, you know, in addition, even while we're waiting for treatments, better understanding the natural history will allow us to, to care for children better because we'll be able to anticipate their needs a bit better and understand what might happen. Um, as as the disease progresses. And that's it. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we've uh, spent the last couple of, or an hour and a half on research um, and moving forward, uh, the next session or half the afternoon, the rest of the afternoon is gonna be a little bit less formal in terms of um, uh, presentation, but an opportunity for us to uh, get to know each other, ask questions, talk openly, because this is the forum that we that we wanna have here and, and, and be able to you know, interact with each other. Um, and for now, I'm gonna do a summary of the foundations. If you could go to the next page, thanks. Um, this agenda is a little out of whack since we had to move things around, but um, that's fine. Uh, next one. I have to fire my husband. He's not doing a very good job so far. <laughs> I hired him solely to press a button. All right. So here we are. Um, so I uh, consulted with Amy Sheridan, who's the UK uh, HABC found Foundation representative that I'm working with. Um, and then also um, our friend Jose Torres in Spain um, to get uh, basically a summary of, uh, of what we've done so far. And and um, so essentially, the Foundation to Fight HABC was the first formal um, uh, nonprofit that was created uh, back in 2015 by my husband and I as a result of our daughter, Eloise, um, getting diagnosed literally a year before that. Um, a little bit of history that I think might be helpful for those of you that are newer um, to the, you know, to, in terms of joining our family here. Um, 2014, I think, was when. Uh, you, Dr. Vander, actually identified the tub 4 A gene. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, right at that time, we were seeing um, Dr. Vandiver at Children's National Hospital Center um, in DC, where she was practicing with the White Matter group there. And we were just happened to be in there asking questions and trying to figure out what was going on and learned um, because Dr. Vandiver did a, a genetic test on Eloise that she had the uh, condition. So Prior to that, I know there's a couple in the room here, Janet, I think you're one of them who um, was with a group of uh, families that um, back in 2014 um, came into DC as a, as a group. And um, uh, yeah, <laughs> we didn't know, we, we weren't diagnosed back then, but Janet, can I just hand the microphone to you? Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you guys did at that time. I'm just gonna stay right here. Uh, in 2000, our child, Sierra, was diagnosed in 2010. So she's one of the early, early kids, and that was by MRI and ex examination. Um, in 2014, we met with Dr. Vandiver in Washington, D.C. There were only seven families at that time, or eight families. Um, 
basically we started donating blood, doing things to start research then at National Children's. And then pretty much just kind of stick with it. We still talk all the time. They're part of our Facebook group and reach out to all the families we can. But yes, it was just a little small but mighty group at that time. So we came in right after that and um, after we kind of pulled ourselves off of the floor and try to figure out how we were going to move forward, we came out, if you will, and, and uh, created the foundation and put ourselves out there and um, got a huge, amazing reception, as I'm sure with Rare Ruby, you guys did the same thing of just going out there and, and telling everybody your story, um, how much people just responded. And it was wonderful. So anyway, we, um, up until between 2015 and currently, um, we've worked with CHOP on the natural history study funding, um, as well as some other research funding. Um, we held uh, or supported a scientific symposium in 2017, if I got my dates right. Um, and then another family conference up in Philadelphia in 2018, which some of you, uh, which joined that conference as well. And then of course, this one is uh, today. Um, we've continued to work towards, you know, basically focusing on the um, research, but branching out more to help and provide support to the families, because that's a very important part of our role here. Um, and so we're now actively giving grants, for example, helping out financially for uh, events like this. Um, and then we have also created um, a database with RareX, which is important for the FDA process um, to have a representative uh, of the families to be and the patients to be represented represented outside of the, um, the researchers. So outside of, of the, in this case, it would be CHOP who's moving forward with the trial. Um, we also have um, spent uh, time working on an FDA listening session. It's available on the FDA uh, website, basically a summary of a, a select group of families uh, situation and how the disease is affecting them. So the FDA can be better versed on the impact of the disease with the families because they hear a lot from the researchers but they don't hear as much from the families and that's become much more of a of a, a focus for them so they want to hear from the families so that's why we did the listening session we um, worked with um, the Spain uh, group as well as the UK group and we put together the listening session which is available on the um, uh, FDA site um, to view and that allows everybody within the FDA who might be interested in this disease to get a, a, an understanding of our perspective on how we're living with HABC and how it impacts our families and our children. And then of course, back um, in 2002, excuse me, 2020, uh, we went entered into a um, sponsored research agreement with UMass, Dr. Gao here, um, and we're in year three of the gene therapy research, um, which, we, which was the first part of the presentation here today. So that's our work to date. And then of course, the HAB Foundation UK <clears throat> was created in 2019. They too have been working actively with CHOP um, and that's how we're here in terms of the ASO moving forward because of the relationship that that group has with um, within the biotech industry and their ability to move it forward, which has been fantastic. Um, Syntaptic Bio um, affiliated with one of the families um, and they're moving forward. Um, I put in here because I was told 2024 um, but again, everything is could be potentially a moving target, but um, we're hoping 2024, it may be later. Um, that's what I've been told so far. Um, and then, of course, the HABC Foundation UK is actively working on grant patient financial support also for th those in the United Kingdom and Europe. Um, and then, of course, th their extra other activities are involved, um, uh, outreach to hospitals to improve uh, awareness of the disease. So hospitals can better diagnose and potentially get, you know, quicker diagnose for patients when they come through, which is, um, I imagine, much easier in the United Kingdom than it is in the United States, just because there's so many hospitals here versus the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, which probably makes it easier. Um, and then, of course, uh, their larger, another project they're working on for some time now um, is, is helping with um, geographic diagnosis to get more patients come forward to get diagnosed. And then our friend Jose Torres uh, in Spain, um, big congratulations to him. He finally uh, managed to get through the red tape in Spain and get the uh, 
Fundacion Tub 4A created now actively out there um, advocating for awareness and raising funds. And they came into an existence just this recently in 2023. So that's a summary of what we've done so far. All right, next page. So um, I don't really need to get into this because I thought it might be helpful since this was going to be the beginning of our presentation, but it's a, just a quick summary of the differences between the ASOs and the AAVs, which are actively under research right now. Um, and some of the challenges that I think we need to get our arms around, no matter which direction we go, is exactly what Dr. Van Der Ver said, uh, you know, funding and, and, and costs to, to not, not only get to the finish line, which clearly with the ASOs, that's moving forward, um, but what happens after the drug is developed and how um, who's going to be paying for the cost to administer it, um, develop it and administer it, and whether insurance um, can pay for it. So that's... Those are ongoing challenges that I, that I, from my perspective, we need to help and, and work through to get answers. And then same with the uh, AAV, um, again, um, challenges of, uh, of covering the costs, but also, um, you know, the complexity with the AAV, which is much more involved, um, which takes longer. So that's why that research is, is probably going to take longer than we, than the ASO. But um, again, it's going to be the next, uh, the next treatment option that we have out there and to have more than one option is, is great. All right, next page. Um, Syntaptics Bio gave us this summary. Um, I think Dr. Vandevert's basically gone through it, um, but basic summary here of um, founded recently in 2021, um, working closely with Dr. Vandevert and CHOP to move forward with the uh, trial, um, getting in front of the uh, FDA as well as the UK equivalent um, to move forward to get through red tape to get the approvals that we need to move forward into a trial. So a lot involved there. Um, I'll leave that there because I'm not a scientist, but um, it's all moving forward. And certainly um, we're excited that um, that they raised the funds to, to get to this point. And then uh, again, AAV status, we've gone through um, uh, that in detail, um, but we just initiated that again in 2020, at right at the beginning of COVID. So um, uh, it's always challenging, of course, but we're very pleased um, to show that there's been improvement in the research. So we're very grateful um, for that. And we're going to continue to fund this to the finish line, um, which may, may take a couple more years, several more years, um, but we're committed to funding this to get to the finish line. Um, and we actually have a partner on our board who um, who's uh, um, very well connected within the pharmaceutical biotech industry. And he has a potential um, partner there that could pick this up if and when we're done to, to help manufacture it and move it forward into a trial. Um, next page. All right. So this is where I wanted to focus on with you guys um, on, on where we're at and what we need from you. Um, we've, we've obviously all collectively come together um, in all our different ways based on what we can do and how we can help. Um, but we need, we need you guys to be involved um, to the extent you can. And there's lots of different ways that you can get involved. Um, and just a little bit or a lot, it's entirely up to you and what you can do and what expertise and, and connections that you can bring to the table. Um, but we're, um, we're trying desperately to continue to raise awareness in the United States and in Europe. Um, through the two foundations, and then, of course, with the, re, the new ad, newly added a foundation in Spain. So we're well established in Europe and United Kingdom and the United States. Um, so, um, you know, just reaching out. To, I know some of you have done some local media work, um, telling your story, organizing events. I give you some handouts um, in, the, in the bag that you have. I mean, just, just some just stuff to start conversations, to move things forward, to get people uh, to talk to people and just to get them aware of where, and honestly, I mean, what we've done in the last eight years, we could well have just sort of sat back and done nothing. And I can't tell you how many people we have met that have come forward along the way that are so connected. I mean, just recently we, we met with an attorney who, um, who does a lot of work with the FDA in, in moving, um, uh, trials through the FDA process. And, he has reached out to us through our connections, my husband's connections, um, and is, a, is now a friend of the foundation that can help us when, if and when we need him. So it's that type of thing, and it's, it's surprising who you might know, 
um, who you might run into, hand out these bracelets. We've, we've had so many different responses from people from the bracelets. And I'm going to let my husband tell a story. And I didn't tell him I was going to do this about a guy that he met in the airport. Yeah, you were in an airport uh, having dinner in the airport, leaving for anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just a conversation. Just hand out that thing and say, hey, and then it sparks up a conversation. Um, yeah, one of my favorite stories is um, uh, my husband was in uh, Florida and we, we were doing a 1031 exchange on a house and we had to get a we had to do it very quickly in order not to be taxed on the purchase. And my husband had gone into a house uh, and was talking to, I guess, the builder and telling the story, the same thing, handing it out, telling a story. Um, and then several weeks later, the guy sent us a Bible. Um, he found, he was into old books. He went to an old bookstore. He found a, a beautiful old Bible and he sent it to us with a beautiful note saying, your husband struck me. Um, I was very moved by him. I'm into this. I'm into old books. I actually love Bible. This guy thought it was worth nothing. I think it's worth something. I can't do much financially, but this might help you. And it's just that sort of thing and, and, and just touching people's hearts. And, and, and again, we can't do it unless we're all networking out there and doing this in our own way, in our own community.
and still is to this day. Yes, Luke. <laughs> That's next on the agenda. <laughs> Um, don't under underestimate yourselves. <laughs> All right. Um, again, it's who you know, and it really is. And you don't, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And that's my motto. Um, so we've met some amazing people that are have opened doors for us in, in many ways, um, not just for fundraising, but also connections and getting in front of key people to move things forward. So um, you, you, you may not think that you know somebody important, but honestly, you probably do. And you'd be surprised who knows who and whose uncle's brother-in-law, you know, may be connected somehow. So don't just keep talking and keep, keep uh, advocating and, and, and raising awareness. Um, supporting families to assist in navigating. We've done a great job with the, um, the, the uh, Facebook page um, that Janet had mentioned. It was created by a family um, that had originally come together once everybody sort of started to to become more familiar and they created a Facebook page. And now all of us, I think, are on that page. And I we have so many Q&A and questions that we have and, and just, you know, support. Um, but I we know more as parents than probably anybody, frankly, in terms of the day to day living and what we're what we're trying to, how we're trying to help our children and resources and equipment and medicines and what works and what doesn't work. And, and, and I think that's hugely important. So again, let's continue to push that and continue to support each other, which I think we're doing a fantastic job with. Um, and then again, if, if any of your, um, whether it's in the United States or UK or Spain, do you have any um, support, uh, you know, expertise in advocacy efforts or even in event planning or, conferences or grant writing. I mean, we've, we know, we know people just through people who know people through their work who know how to grant, do some grant writing. We did a grant write, uh, uh, some grant writing last year through one of our um, parents who is connected with somebody who's, who's in the industry. So it's, it's all about, you know, connecting connections and who you know. Um, so that's our information there. I think you all know who we are. Um, uh, HABC.org is the US side and then HABCfoundation.org is uh, UK. And then um, as uh, Spain continues to get up and running, um, hopefully you've seen their website too and what they're doing. So let's give them a lot of support too because they they really uh, have done a tremendous job doing what they're doing. It's been a big, big lift. All right, next page. All right, so again, next preparation for getting to the next stage towards a clinical trial. Um, continuing to pursue the uh, AAV gene therapy um, research. Um, and then my question to you was, and I wanted to open this up for discussion, is what, what we, can we do in the meantime and what is helping? And I'd like to open this up as a sort of a working, you know, discussion amongst us here of, of what we're doing that's helping um, for what helping our kids, um, you know, how how are we improving their lives while we're waiting, um, and what is actually working? And may, maybe it's working for one and not necessarily for another. But um, I'd like to open it up for discussion and 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 get everybody's input. I won't pick on anybody. <laughs> here as far as from a parent well I mean well no you're right you're right I'm second but um you all know that as they get bigger they're heavier and they're harder to transport and you go to a store and how do you change these kids there's you know and I know things are getting better and there's places that are implementing adult size changing tables but Olivia is an 18 years old and 110 pounds for the days of carrying her or even laying her in the back of the van, like I'm sure some of you can do, are done. So my neighbor 
has a little girl who's two years old and live with CP. And she introduced me to a procedure. I don't know how it works for boys. I think the same, but it's called the Mitrofenoff. Anybody know what a Mitrofenoff is? Okay, so no, that would be a cath of a different method. This is a surgery you have to have. It's cathing her, but I cath her through her belly button. It's not inhumane. No one knows what it is. If you do, you can do it anywhere. But it allows it another level of independence where we don't have to take her somewhere and change her. Now, the other, how do I say this nicely? We did not do the bowels. How's that? We just did to capture urine, right? To keep her as dry as possible. Luckily, we can most oftentimes catch the other part morning or night and we're good. On occasion, not, but whatever. It allows us though, I could come here, travel for six hours, stop and get gas, Catherine in the van quick, get a bag. I just, Catherine put it in a Ziploc bag and throw it away. But our lives have changed because I don't not go places because I'm going to change her. I pray she doesn't poop on the way. All right. I'm not going to lie. I pray that that doesn't happen. But, but the Mitrofenov gave us a level of independence that I would never have known had my neighbor not told me that that's what they did with their CP daughter, who's 20 years old. So I know you might not be there yet, but if you're there or you get there, you can do it. It doesn't have to be with girls or boys. What they do is take the appendix, which you don't need, right? Confirm with me, Dr. V. And they make it, they, they, and Olivia's was like in a weird spot, like way up here. She goes, oh yeah, I just pulled, or Dr. Ours is Dr. V. He took it and he made it into a stoma. Okay, that's on right. And, and connected the bladder to like her belly button area. And I just put a cath, it's, it's, it's got a, cro a crooked tip or like a tilt, slanted tip. And I just slide it in there and wait till the pee, pee starts coming. And it's right into a Ziploc bag and throw it away. I just did it. That's why I took her out and did. Because I knew that I'm like, oh crap, I got it. Because I time it. We try to do with her when we're out and about. We try to do every two hours. And it takes five minutes, not even. But it's a way where you don't have to always change them. Now, I don't know if there's a magic age to do this. Meaning if they're still little and you can do it, take that as long as you can. But now that we can't and Sierra, you know, we've got these older kids. But this is a piece that's, that's worked for us. Uh, my husband doesn't do it. That's fine. He thinks it's it's a mom thing because she's a girl, but it doesn't matter. It's not invasive. It's not like you're no, and no one even knows what you're doing. I did it out there. People didn't even look like, what are you doing? I could be feeding her, and like here, it's obvious that no one cares because we all have somebody's got something going on, right? So this is a very very safe place to do this and show anybody. And if anybody wants to see me do it, I'm happy to show you what it looks like. Um, Anyway, that's just one little thing that is working in our life at the age that we are. And I know that a lot of you are not in those phases yet. And I think this is good. I didn't have a Facebook page, you know, like you didn't either huh? until a long time ago. And I had to navigate all this or we did day by day. And sometimes it is a day by day and you want to lose your mind day by day. But we got a lot of, I have a wonderful neighbor. Michelle and I are neighbors in Minnesota with two kiddos. Can we, do, should we share that story quick? Okay, so back, it was a Christmas, and I'll make it quick so we can get on. Um, we went bowling, and we were way on the far end, and we had to live, had the helper thing, you know, the little thing, the ramp, thank you, the ramp. And all of a sudden, this other family came, and there was a little boy, and we shared the ramp. Then Olivia and Caden shared the ramp. And I don't know, a few weeks later, I saw it on Channel 5, which means we should probably contact the news again. They did a story on them. And I'm like, real. I'm like, that's the that, that, that's the people that were right next door. And and he has H dash ABC. So I, I don't even know how I found you. I stalked her. Yeah, because I got the name. Yes, because they said her name on the news, right? So I stalked her. I'm like, I called her and I said, Michelle, sit down. Are you sitting? And she's like, Yeah. And I said, Okay, so does Caden have H dash ABC? And she said, Yes. I said, so does Olivia. I don't know if we laughed or if we cried. <laughs> yeah, literally. And it's like, oh my gosh. So you don't have this island is what I'm getting at. There's, and Facebook helps. 
Um, so if anything, I'm just saying, reach out to us. I mean, I'm been around the block a lot with this, whether it's a little girl, a little boy, and you need help, just message me or I am or whatever we can do. I mean, I'm just saying, because that's the piece we don't always know where to go. And you can talk to even doctors. I had docs that don't know what the hell this is, but they're, but they don't give up and they contact, I think they have contacted her team. I mean, Minnesota, we are blessed with a Gillette hospital and, and Michelle will attest to this. They get it. And my, my neurologist for lives has a special needs child. He gets it. And that's the piece that most people don't have is someone that gets it. Because, oh, I, oh, I'm so sorry. No, I, we don't need your sympathy. We need your money. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I mean, yes and no, right? But I'm just saying that, exact, kidding, but not kidding. Yeah, open up. But I, I mean, it's just, I, I think there's a lot we can do, but I think you're right, Michelle. We have to do it together. We cannot do this. It's not Michelle and, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. But thank you. Um, it's not their job to do all this, right? We are a family of H-B kiddos. And we have to do this together. And I'm, you know, I mean, yeah, you do your little birthday donation or you do it on Facebook and you set it up like this is what I'm doing. I put two grand on my birthday. Not for me. For them. That's that simple. I don't know. I mean, we need a lot more than two grand, but I'm saying. Do it, guys. Put it on when it says, you know, you can set it up to, maybe you can even help set it up to ping us, say, hey, you can you can do it on Facebook anytime. So anyway, I'm off the soapbox. <laughs> you? Anything Anybody? I don't have any tips or tricks, but I'm just saying for the people, I know we have a lot of younger kiddos here. Um, we went through lots of um, hip surgeries, like pelvic osteotomies, spinal surgeries. So just any questions, because usually coming up on those surgeries are pretty scary as far as what the aftercare is. So like Caden has his spinal surgery. So Kristen and I got together, even though Olivia is, is much older, but just to help understand like the process of the surgery, what things are going to look like just for the aftercare. So just kind of knowing who the older kids and people that have went through some of the things so that you guys have some resources for the younger younger families. That's really it. I was just going to say, um, keep your kids happy, but keep yourselves happy too. Um, take breaks and let people help you. And I know a lot about backlifting pumps. <laughs> so, that's it. Between backlifting pumps and my offs, we got it. Me? I, what do you want me to say? I got two copies. My daughter just brought me a copy too, so I'm going to be wired. All right, this is everybody. Those on the camera. This is this is the lady that. Oh, I'm Kristen. Yeah, I'm from Minnesota, and um, it took 12 years to find out what was wrong with Olivia. So those of you that got to find out in a couple years, bless you. We were all over the country looking for what happened. Oh, she'll walk when she's ready. No, we're ready. She's 15 months old. We, I knew something was wrong. I have two other girls. They walked at nine and 10 months. She had all the milestones. Everything was normal. Built a two-story house. Why? Now I have an elevator, three floors. We have a lift from the garage to the house. We have a bathroom in the basement, all hers, huge, walking in. It's Olivia's house. You know, that's, that's, that, that is stupid, isn't it? A dumb way to say that when we don't walk well. It's a rolling. Yes, it's absolutely rolling. But, you know, I will have to say, I don't know where you live, but Minnesota takes care of their kids. Don't you think, Shell? There's a lot. And I feel so bad. I see this on Facebook where people have to go fund me for the vans and the ramps. That is wrong. We don't have that in Minnesota. So if y'all want to move, we got a great state. They take care of our kids. They take care of us. Yeah, that, yeah, if you don't, yeah, we got a lot of snow, but that's all right. Um, I'm just thankful that this is real. We didn't have this. 
Or maybe it was, but I didn't know. I didn't know anything about it. And then people go, what is that? that I don't know. Is there a cure? I don't know. That's what our life was like seven years ago. Yeah. We ended up at NIH. Olivia got um, in their undiagnosed disease program. Because that's where we, we had nowhere else to go. Thank goodness our pediatrician was fabulous. And she wrote a letter and got her in. We were there for a week. And I've never had so much done in a week from eight to five. I went from her hair to her toenails. They looked at her and we knew we came out knowing nothing, which we knew. We knew we weren't going to get any, we were your guinea pig, which is we were fine with the fact that if there was one kid that could, they could do something or something they could learn that would help one kiddo, even if it wasn't ours, we're okay with that. Takes a lot to impress my husband, who's an engineer, but he said that was the best five days. They're so good. So we, it took a couple years. We went back home. And now it reminds me, if you're connected to NIH, they have all her stuff. <laughs> From as far as me making sure that you guys have everything, um, that might be a... Did you? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so that we came home with, I'm not kidding, probably a six-inch stack of testing, all normal. There's been a day where, like, I don't want normal. What is this? You know, you just come... You do, but you don't. There's days where I'm like, oh, I don't even want to know what this is. And there's days like, but shouldn't we know? So we should know what to do next or how to fix this. And then we got the day. Now, actually, we flew back. They're like, okay, so here's this new trial drug we want to try. And, um, but there's caveat. And I said, well, what's that? And they're like, well, and I'm going to say it wrong, but I know you'll know what I'm talking about. So I don't know what the name of the med was. It doesn't really matter. but they had to do a blood test. Is it like a PTT or a TPP? Or it's how your blood clots. Okay. And the FDA came up with a magic number. Let's say it was 40. And Olivia could never get to the 40. We tested her for two or three days straight, trying to get this number down so we could try this med. And it was going to be as like a 10-month process of coming back and forth to the NIH. Like every, like I was dreading that thought alone of flying all of that time and doing all these things. And half of it's placebo and half of it's, you know, real. And you don't know and you don't know. But we came to the conclusion that she wasn't going to have an, she wasn't going to be below, or below a 40. Later on, we find out none of these kids will. This is part of the disease. They will not have that magic number from a clotting perspective, is what they were told. So it was a waste. There's no, we weren't going forward with this. But then we also found out, they're like, well, we, we think we know what this is. Merry Christmas. I'm like, Merry Christmas, maybe? They said, we think it's H-ABC. And I'm like, okay. But that's how we found out. But 12 years, I went shopping. I went $30,000 in debt. It's called retail therapy. Don't do it. My husband started to drink. Don't do that either. I have a neighbor who just has a little guy that's two weeks old that got diagnosed with, I'm going to say it wrong, hydros, it's the water on the brain. Thank you. I can say it sometimes. And now I have to figure out how to help her navigate this, right? So I don't have to help her. I get to help her. She knows that there's help. But... I guess I just, just want you guys to all know that you have a huge family. We have a huge family here. And whatever, even if it's just to, just to vent, to cry, shell, glass of wine. I mean, that, that, that's real, right? Mindy, if you were closer, I wish you were. Um, but you know what? As Mindy said, that kid out there smiles all the time. And she had all those skills. And they took it away. But she is why we're here and why. Because I know that that's 
one right there is a bear and I am too. And you pissed me off about this kid. And, and I don't mean to, to swear, but you know what? I do swear. I do get mad. And Michelle, even worse. I love you. Um, it is though, I, you know, you have to try to give them every advantage you can. Let them try it. I, t I talk to her like she's 18. I don't expect her to respond. I don't expect her to react like she's 18. But you, I treat her. She knows cognitively that kid is in there. She knows everything. I can change my tone with her and be like, okay, Liv, that's enough. That's enough. If she's whining or whatever. She's got all the emotions, guys. They have the emotions. They feel it. They know it. I learned the hard way. So all I'm just trying to do is tell you that, again, Mindy, you said it best. Make them, keep them happy. Keep them going, doing as long as you can. Fly with them. I don't know if I could fly right now with her. When the airlines all get this new seat figured out, like I just saw, I'm going to be on that plane. I'm taking her. Right now, it's a little tough. But we'll drive. So anyway, I don't know if there's anything more you want me to say, but. I'm just saying that, you know, this is one big, wonderful family and we got to keep it going. We got to fight. We got to raise money. We got to get this to a treatment. I don't care if it's, you know, you guys are little ones. You got a lot of time. I don't know what we have. I don't know. I had a neurologist tell me that at 10 years old, you'll look, she'll make 10. You want to know what happened to that guy? You don't even know what it is, but you have the balls to tell me that she's going to lucky if she makes it till 10 because it's degenerative. I think I scared my husband that day too. I'm not kidding you. I was so on fire and I let everything fly. And he's like, let's go, honey. Let's go, honey. Let's go. Don't tell me what you don't know. And I want to walk her in there or roll her in there and go, okay, you son of a bitch. She's 19. 19 next month. And she's not getting any worse. She's not getting any worse. She had a spinal fusion, finally. It's, and don't be scared of that. It's the best thing we ever did because now we can lift her really well. It's a lot easier to lift. They're what? Oh, no. Noodley is horrible. Those rods are magic. And I know yeah, you got them, and I know you'll, you'll probably need them, you know, and don't, don't be scared of it. That surge, I'm not going to lie. I sat there praying my heart off from 8, 9.45 to 5.30 p.m. And Dr. Tron came out and said it was perfect. And she, I'll show you her scar. You can't hardly see it. It's beautiful. So we were, we haven't had the hip, hip, the hip surgeries or anything like that, but um, we won't need to until maybe she's older and has a hip replacement someday because she's a little tiny bit off, but that's okay. She's happy and she's not in pain. And that's all I can gauge. If she's smiling, we're good. And that, and she doesn't have an eye gaze. She doesn't communicate except with her face and her smile. And that's good enough. Anybody else want to talk? Um, drink my whole coffee. <laughs> no, I don't need to be clapped. It's okay. Anybody else want to come up and talk? Go. Um, okay. I'm good here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, what I've learned is not to be afraid to ask anyone if they have um, any knowledge of any kid with special needs. So what I have found is I have found multiple charities in the St. Louis area. We're from St. Louis and I have been able to reach charity. We weren't able to get standards, uh, the equipment we needed. That was our biggest thing. And we reached out to charities and were able to get temporary ones. We had people bring them to us. There is such a community out there. If you find them and ask for help. Don't be afraid to go on Facebook Marketplace. You would it is unbelievable how many people like my kid is the same weight. Uh, they had a similar condition, maybe not the same thing, but we will bring you a go-to chair. We will bring you the stander um, until you can get your own, and that has been so beneficial for him. So, don't be afraid to be loud. <laughs>
So you can, you can test. We have PCAs in Minnesota. They're called personal care attendants, right? And I go through a company called ACRA and they have, no, I find them, I interview them and I hire them, but I don't have to deal with everything else. Application, paperwork, payroll, all goes through the company. I could not have done, I wouldn't have a life if I didn't have a PCA help. I have four of them right now. You know what you do? You find colleges, you find, um, I found two just now from a HOSA program at my high school. I reached out like, okay, that's a health organization. These are kiddos going into nursing, PT, OT, things like that. Great candidates. Now, I don't know what states you guys are all from, but again, Minnesota, we have a great system for this. So we get, we don't pay for this, right? Um, I'm in a whole different ballgame now because Olivia's is 18. So we have a new waiver called CDCS, which is a budget where I'm a parent paid PCA right now. I make $44,000 a year taking care of my kid tax-free. Not bragging at all. I'm telling you what is out there. I, you, you know what? And I don't know why you wouldn't. I mean, you could floor, you could have a vacation or keep your other second home there. You know, and no, it's not bad weather, you guys. It really isn't bad weather. <laughs> Now, let me back up. Last year's snow sucked. But I'm from North Dakota, so you know what? That's worse. So Minnesota is a step up for me, right? So we, we uh, you just hunker down and you, and you turn on the fireplace and you rent movies and you eat or have some wine. What is wrong with that? You can do that anywhere, right? I mean, really, you guys go pay to go to the mountains to do it. Just go to Minnesota and you can just watch the snow. It's beautiful. You seen a snowblower and a husband or somebody to plow this stuff. I actually, we do sometimes see families move, right? Because um, uh, without taking into consideration all those state-based mandates and support systems. And then sometimes, you know, I think if I can say one thing is to do your homework before you move, because there really are really big differences state to state. And and I'm 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 not on the tourism board for any particular state, so I'm not going to endorse any particular state. Chop does not let me allow me to endorse anything, anyways. But there there are really big differences in sort of state Medicaid programs and state programs, and so I think it's it is important to do your homework. Um, and uh, and so uh, I think Minnesota is not the only one with some of these benefits, but they are very variable. So um, we are we are looking to relocate possibly to Florida. That's always been our dream, and the reason why is because Eloise always wanted to train dolphins. So we are trying to live up, live to, you know, give have her dream. And so she'll be finishing school at 21 because she's on an extended program in the state of Maryland. And um, we've been researching what is available in the state of Florida. And I know that there's some folks uh, probably listening in on what, what, what it's like to, to live in the state of Florida with a child like ours. And I, I don't know if I can make that decision. I mean, honestly, I'll be giving up so much if I leave the state of Maryland because the, of the, the different waivers that she qualifies for at age 21 and all the other stuff that, that we need to seriously keep or try to go back and forth at least to maintain that. that, that. And that is so huge. It, it really is. And, I, I, in, and my only point of even bringing this up, guys, was the fact of the help because that's where you get the this mom and dad when you're trying to do it all or one doesn't do what you think they should do and they're not helping as much or, you know, I mean, I'm, I felt it. I don't, it's okay. It's okay. Don't, don't it's, this isn't about, this isn't man or husband smashing. This is just the reality that because she's a girl, I think I, I, I've always been in control and the caretaker, which is fine. I'm not complaining, but I am getting older too. And it is harder sometimes to do things and so sometimes Dave doesn't lift her right. Could you not? Like, you're the only one that doesn't know how to lift her. You have, I'll take this, you know, this. And then he gets like, you know, so I'm just saying, I, you get it. And it, you can't, you, nobody's perfect. And there's no perfect marriage. And there, you know what I mean? But I have to step back and go, you know, I'm just thankful that you're here to help me at all. Because sometimes this doesn't work for couples, right? It, it, there's a lot of special needs families that just don't make it. And um, it's not easy, no. Does it suck sometimes? Yes. I, I'm just saying, you know, and you know what though? It is a-okay because now, now it's working. But I, I'm just getting back to the PCA thing. Check it out. Check your state. Check your, if you, if you don't have it or you didn't know that it was an option, it is a lifesaver for me. It has been. 
Yeah, exactly. I don't know what it's called in other states, but in Minnesota, it's, it's called PCAs. Um, and then there's there's respite care. If that sounds familiar to anybody, that's that's another piece that kind of follows within that bucket. Um, but also, the, depending on the waivers you have, Olivia was on a waiver called Caddy, which is a whole different waiver that I didn't even know that this other waiver existed. So the CDCS is, I don't even know what that stands for. Is that the same in the in the, the whole country, I wonder? it's yeah. That's part of the problem is that every state is different. It's different. And so you, you just don't know. I guess if I could just plant the seed of dig, look, see what your state has. Yeah. Absolutely. Your social worker there, like at ours at Gillette's, yes. And they're kind of like we've had, because we've had Olivia in, in care for since she was two and a half, three. And the, to get the waivers, you have to have a county social worker too, right, involved. And they have to come out every six months and do their evaluation and all this stuff. And that's that's how Minnesota is. And I'm sure that you guys too are fully aware of that process. So just always ask questions, I guess, is maybe what I'm getting at is, what is this? Do we have this? What kind of help can we get? Is there caregivers? Is there, you know, I mean, I yeah, I, I had to figure it out myself. So if there's anything I can do to help you guys figure that out, other than just dig, 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 ask questions. Anyway, thanks. I think I've. Um, said can I hire you? I I can't pay you anything, but can you can you can I hire you? Sure, You're a great I'll, speaker. I'll fly out to Maryland. I'll fly out to Maryland. Sure, I've never. No, you don't have to be in there. Maryland. You can be anywhere. Virtual. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, it's though, just, um, uh, having 18 years of trying to figure it out yourself, if I can just help one of you, we help make your lives easier or help navigate this um you know where to find me facebook i'm in what's your name again and your email address and your phone number oh it's in my oh no my my infamous drink ticket for later wait <laughs> here i already so. used mine oh no i have three more girl and i got lives too <laughs> thank you listen all right. Anybody else have any thoughts? Those that have been doing this longer than others, anything that's working, that's not working? I don't know about other states, of course. Oh. I know. She doesn't like to. I talk too much. It's not talking. Yeah, you gotta put it right up to your mouth. Okay. Um, I don't know about other states. You should check. But in Colorado, we have community service boards. So in our area, we have an organization called North Metro Community Service. Families that have children with developmental delays and disabilities get stipends. We get $2,400 a year from them. Tax-free, here's your check. What do you do with it? We get, um, and we use it exclusively in play for serious hip hypotherapy, horse therapy. But they have also come to our house and paid for a porch and deck to be built on the front of our house with a ramp. They have paid to have a uh, electric ceiling lift installed in her bedroom that has a track that runs to her, her bathtub. And this spring they paid to have a contractor come and install, she has a walk-in bathtub, her own little private jacuzzi space. So people should check out, and Colorado, they're all over the state, but in see what other states have community service boards. They're philanthropists, they've got the money, just ask them for it. So on top of our $2,400 a year, we've had three major construction projects paid for the last five years. I mean, do you think there's a, a better way for us to be sharing and communicating across to help everybody to, to, as a resource, is there, is there a better way to do it other than on Facebook? Cause I don't think everybody's on Facebook and I know many on, on it regularly. Um, yeah, the website's public. Now, there is a family Facebook page in case you all didn't know, but. Okay. Okay.
We have a website, honey, yes. <laughs> well, one of the things that I've been spending some time doing just because, you know, I'm looking for other alternatives while we wait, um, we have we have spent the last couple of years looking into different natural sub supplements and remedies that our Lord put on this earth for our use. And um, we actually now have connected with somebody who's very well um, uh, respected in the pharmaco pharma pharmacological space. And, um, and uh, we, we actually have worked up a, a plan for, and it's based on a theory, based on what we think is the cause, because we don't know what the cause is. Um, but, and none of it's detrimental, it's all natural remedies. So um, basically we've developed a cocktail for my daughter that she has one in the morning and one at night. And it's based on a whole um, mix of uh, supplementals um, that I put through her tube and mash it up and put it through a tube. And um, we're just gonna continue to, to monitor her and, and watch her and um, it can only help her healthly, health wise. And maybe it'll maybe we'll get lucky and it'll help with um, whatever's causing the issues with the, the myelination. So that's something that we've been doing, whether it's, you know, it, I'm not saying that you should or recommending it. I mean, you can certainly look into it yourself and um, explore it further with your doctor. But it's certainly something that we've spent some time doing and I've always thought that natural remedies are, are a, quite a possibility to help our kids um, because the body is a, is a, is a natural being. So um, I'll let you know what I learned and if anything comes out of it, but um, that's what we've been doing. Are you guys finding that they're putting your kiddos on besides baclofen? What was that? Okay. Can you repeat that so the people? Lyrica. Okay. Um, has anybody else ever heard of? Do you know risperidone? I've heard of it. Oh, gotcha. That's awesome. Yeah. So I'm finding that when we're just chatting between us casually. There's a lot of different things out there that, like Olivia, per your cocktail, and maybe per your bowel question, she's on Miralax every night, half a cap, but that keeps her just fine. Um, she's also on magnesium. Yep. She's on vitamin D. She has, see, the morning is vitamin D, risperidone, and baclofen. Mid midday is risperidone, baclofen. Di oh, excuse me, don't forget diazepam. Anybody else on that one? You go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I would. No. I want. This is what I want. Tell me yes or no. <laughs> so risperidone is part of um, the sort of atypical uh, neuroleptic agents, and some of those have more side effects on the basal ganglia than others. Now, it can also help control some of the basal ganglia, but I would just use it with caution, um, and um, because I think that. Um, because we just don't know um, what effects it has on, on the basal ganglion. We already know the basal ganglion and the TBC are vulnerable. So it's just a class of medications that that I just I just don't want everybody going out and giving yep. risperidone. Yeah. So, yeah. So I just, yeah, I would just put, put a, a, an asterisk of caution on um, neuroleptic. That's great to know. And, like, just as a side note to that, then how do you, like, if, can we as a parent make that call to back off no yeah okay <laughs> talk to your doctor okay anything no, that to, we're talking about saying. here you should talk to your doctor yeah absolutely it's, it's I'm an individual it's like is there anything any med that's really working good for your guys as kids that might be a conversation to have with our doctor or for our kids
uh, they did give us a lot of inform other information we could use um, in treating kids with these chronic inf infections. And um, they also like to follow up even on the antibiotics you're using. So if you're using, you know, if you go and you're on your fourth antibiotic with your pediatrician or even our pulmonologist at that point, um, immunology wanted to be involved in that and make sure this is working for them. And if it's not, they would like to, re they really look into researching um, if it's something else that could be helping them. That's good. So Dr. Vander, I have a couple of questions and I know I asked this of you way back when, but can you explain to us the variants, why there's such an extreme variation within all these variants from, you know, kids that can't roll over versus kids like my daughter that was fully developed and then declined. What, and where, where are these variants? Why are they all over the place like that? Uh, so there, there, when a mutation happens, it's a basically a, um, you know, a change of one base pair for another. And there are certain um, things that are called mutation hotspots, just the sequence of different base pairs make it more likely that a spelling mistake happens trying to come up with a good way of saying it, but it's like it's, you know, people are more likely to misspell certain words recurrently, right? So there's some mutations that are called hotspots, um, but otherwise mutations can happen really anywhere, right? So there's going to be a large variety of mutations because um, the mutations can happen anywhere, even if some places are more common to recur, right? So then once you have a mutation, you know, that spelling mistake is going to change the shape of the protein because the different amino acids have slightly different shapes. And so they're going to cause slightly different folding parameters. And instead of having a nice, tight, round sort of ball structure, you're going to have pieces, you know, you're going to have a shape and a, and a what's called a tertiary formation that where the protein folds a little bit differently. And depending on how the protein is folding differently, that might mean that it might not assemble to its best friend quite as well, or it might not assemble well into those tubes, or might not unstick from those tubes well, or might not allow those molecular motors to attach. And depending on what happens, that might affect different cells differently. So there's good data now that different mutations are more likely to more affect the oligodendrocytes or more affect the neurons. And depending on what cells are more or less affected and in what way, you might have different disease presentations. Does that help at all? Yeah, I mean, I think we talk more and more about spectrums of disease. And, you know, I think um, uh, even if they, the disease manifests itself differently, if we think that in all cases it's that um, misfolded protein that's not operating quite as well and is toxic to the cell, then the therapeutic approach is the same. So I think you might need to break the disease into pieces to effectively test drugs, but that doesn't mean that it's not all one approach. We think right now. Not that I know of. I mean, I have done repurposing strategies. If I thought that there was an easy repurposing strategy, I would have gone after them. I'm a very pragmatic person. There are other diseases where I've borrowed on the shelf drugs, but I don't think that's a, I don't think it's an approach that I can think of for top 4 I. So um, it's 4.45. Um, what I thought we could do is spend, maybe take a quick break and then spend 30 minutes until they close the babysitting down, which is at 5.30, I think. Yeah. I thought it was 5.30. Yeah. So we could just as a group collectively come together and, and regroup on what we spent our time doing today, just the families. Does that work for everybody? You all up to that? All right. All right, we'll be back. <laughs>